This diagram shows the normal pressures in the different chambers of the heart. You can see on the very left side of the diagram is the right atrium, and normal right atrial pressure is between 0 and 5 millimeters of mercury. Remember that that means 0 to 5 millimeters of mercury above atmospheric pressure, which is generally approximately 760 millimeters of mercury, or one atmosphere. Next is the right ventricle, which has a normal systolic pressure of less than 25 millimeters of mercury and a normal diastolic pressure of less than 5 millimeters of mercury. Past the pulmonic valve is the pulmonary artery. The pulmonary artery pressure is usually less than 25 over 10 millimeters of mercury. If the mean pulmonary artery pressure is greater than 25 millimeters of mercury, that denotes pulmonary hypertension. After the pulmonary artery, we'll talk about the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. The wedge pressure generally should be less than 12 millimeters of mercury, and the wedge pressure is an approximation of left atrial pressure. We're able to obtain wedge pressure by a Swan-Gans catheter that has a balloon tip that occludes one of the small pulmonary arteries and measures the pressure just distal to the occlusion. We measure wedge pressure because it is much safer to measure wedge pressure than it is to put a catheter in the left atrium and measure the pressure that way. It is important for us to remember what the wedge pressure is in a patient because the wedge pressure, which is analogous to the left atrial pressure, is approximately equal to the left ventricular end diastolic pressure. And left ventricular end diastolic pressure is preload. So we can equate wedge pressure with preload in most patients. And this tells us how bad a patient's heart failure is. If a person has very bad left ventricular heart failure, their wedge pressure will be markedly elevated in most cases. In patients with mitral valve stenosis, the wedge pressure will actually be higher than that of the left ventricular end diastolic pressure because of the inability of the blood to actually get into the left ventricle. So mitral stenosis can throw off your wedge pressure as an estimation of left ventricular diastolic pressure. The left atrial pressure, again, is usually less than 12 millimeters of mercury. Left ventricular pressure has a very high range. It ranges from approximately 130 systolic to 10 diastolic. And remember that aortic pressure is usually less than 130 over 90 millimeters of mercury. Blood flow to an organ remains constant over a wide range of perfusion pressures. So as mean arterial pressure goes up and down, the organ likes to maintain a certain blood flow. Different organs have different abilities and different ways by which they determine their autoregulation. There are some that you absolutely should know. For example, the heart circulation, which is the coronary arteries and the coronary veins, leading to the coronary sinus is generally determined by local metabolites, such as oxygen, adenosine, and nitric oxide. Adenosine and nitric oxide cause vasodilation and increase in coronary blood flow. In the brain, it's also local metabolites, such as carbon dioxide, and a resultant drop in pH that determines blood flow. The higher the carbon dioxide, the more the blood flow will occur. In the kidneys, the arteries use primarily a myogenic and tubuloglomerular feedback mechanism for determining autoregulation. Myogenic feedback means that as blood pressure increases to the kidney, in order to protect the fragile glomeruli from the high blood pressure, arterioles will vasoconstrict in order to decrease perfusion to the kidney. Tubuloglomerular feedback means that as blood pressure drops in the kidney, the tubular glomerular apparatus can sense that and will increase blood flow to the kidney by causing vasodilatation. In the lungs, you have different arterioles that all have different levels of oxygenation. The lung is able to vasoconstrict areas of the lung 
that are not being well ventilated, so that only the well ventilated areas of the lung are being well perfused. We call this hypoxic vasoconstriction. In other organs, hypoxia causes vasodilatation in order to increase blood flow to that organ. So the lungs are sort of unique in that aspect. In skeletal muscle, it's also local metabolites such as lactic acid, adenosine, and potassium that cause vasodilatation. In the skin, the cutaneous circulation is primarily dictated by sympathetic and parasympathetic stimulation. And this is very important for temperature autoregulation. The final topic in the physiology section is capillary fluid exchange. It's very important to remember what the different forces are at the level of the capillary. The capillary is responsible not only for nutrient, but also for water exchange. There are four different starling forces that determine the fluid movement through the capillary membranes. At the beginning of the capillary, on the arteriolar side, you have capillary hydrostatic pressure, or P sub C. Capillary hydrostatic pressure is simply the blood pressure. And that pressure pushes fluid out of the capillary into the extravascular space. The interstitial fluid pressure pushes against the capillary pressure and pushes fluid back into the capillary at the end of the capillary near the venous end. Pi sub C is the plasma colloid osmotic pressure, which is primarily dictated by the plasma protein concentration of the blood. This tends to pull fluid into the capillary. Pi sub I is the interstitial fluid colloid osmotic pressure, and this pulls fluid out of the capillary. These pressures are then added and subtracted together in order to determine the net filtration pressure. The formula for the net filtration pressure is shown here, and that is P sub C minus P sub I minus pi sub c minus pi sub i. That net filtration pressure is multiplied by what we call the capillary filtration coefficient, or the Kf. The net fluid flow is then equal to the net pressure multiplied by the Kf. If the net fluid flow is positive, that means that in that capillary, you favor filtration, or movement of flow out of the capillary into the extravascular space. If the net flow is negative, then that capillary fa favors reabsorption of fluid back into the capillary. Edema occurs when excess fluid outflow into the interstitium is occurring, and that is commonly caused by, first of all, an increased capillary pressure, which is an increased P sub C, and that's commonly seen in patients with heart failure due to retention of fluid by the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Edema is also caused by decreased plasma protein concentrations, or decreased pi sub C, which is commonly seen in patients with nephrotic syndrome or patients in liver failure. Edema is also caused by increased capillary permeability, or increased KF, which is commonly seen in infections and severe sepsis, as well as toxins and in burn situations, and increased interstitial fluid colloid osmotic pressure which is commonly seen in patients that have lymphatic blockages, such as with malignancies.